The problem most people have, dude, is exactly what you said. Iman operates at a higher level than 99% of people will ever even imagine. I've done a lot of different biohacking things, bro, and a lot of different routines. What I do now is... You already having that mentality of having the seven-figure mindset. Would you even be able to teach that to a beginner? What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another sit down with Paul Daly. How are we doing, man? I'm good, man. How are you? Fantastic, fantastic. I know you're out here in Scottsdale for about a day, yeah. so I'm very thankful for you to stop by and just hop on for a few minutes. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and just chop it up a bit. So, tell me what's new, man. You got a new uh, new business stuff going on. Yeah. I want to go into what everything what you got going on right now, as well as your background, and just let the viewers know what's up. Yeah, bro. I like no one's no one started yet by saying like, "What's new, man? What are you up to now?" <laughs> um, I have a portfolio company. Main thing in the portfolio company right now is the consulting firm uh, where we're working with info products, usually guys that have some kind of organic following, some kind of audience and helping them turn their audience into clients and customers. Okay. So just converting viewers into like customers. Yeah. yeah most, most guys who do a lot of content have to sacrifice their business acumen and like their ability to understand how to build businesses because to be a full-time content creator, to be, I'm sorry, to be a good content creator that actually gets following, you have to be full-time, mm -hmm. right? And if you're full-time there, that means that you're taking time away, energy away and focus away from business acumen and learning how to build a business. And so realistically, what I do is find people who got really good at content, had to kind of say, okay, I'm gonna let someone else focus on the business stuff and kind of help them help them there, help them grow that. Okay, so in a way, kind of like a, uh, a growth partner, kind of, but yeah. for content creators. Yeah, you know, the easiest way to explain it, I talked to Luke Alexander, I don't know if you know who yeah, Luke is. Yeah, we're gonna Luke's, film with him in a few days. He's a really good buddy of mine. Um, and I'm an IPO. I hate it. Like this is, you okay. know, Luke. I was going to ask you about that because that's his new thing. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm not in his program. Love Luke. I'm sure <laughs> he has an amazing program, but like he FaceTimed me like crazy because he was so excited about it before he dropped it. And I was like, yeah, he was like, what do you think of that? And I was like, it's what I'm, it's what I'm doing. <laughs> so I, like, I think it's an awesome idea. Uh, but yeah, the easiest way to say it is I'm a, a growth consultant, growth operator, IPO. There's like a thousand names for it. But the things, uh, info products, uh, what's the oh, info, product, info product, product operator? Yeah, that's it. Okay, awesome. Well, that makes this really interesting because he's doing that too. I'm just starting to learn more about that with like okay. a school community and stuff like that. Yeah. So cool, man. that'll be hype. Let's go into your background though because not many people know your background. People just have seen you in the past just um, perhaps in the background of Iman's content and stuff like that. So I want to have you shine. Go, what's your entire background? How did you even want to get into entrepreneurship? How did you want to become a business owner and what did that look like? I never, I never cared or tried or wanted to become a business owner or anything. So I, none of, none of my stuff, or I'm sorry, none of what I've done over the last 10 years has been to my own plans or accord. It's just been what God set out for me to do. And I've stumbled and fell and failed my way into where I am now. Mm. And so with, um, I'm sorry, man, I'm trying to make sure I'm really careful with this wire. So I don't get any, am I doing anything no, wrong with chilling. this? No, you're chilling. Let me just pull it closer cool. to you. We're good. Which one? The tech issues of podcast. You know? <laughs> um, so I started, you know, I'll kind of zip through this, but you can ask questions on whatever you want. But I started in car sales, ended up running a couple, couple car dealerships for five years, uh, did some government stuff, did some software stuff, and then started a sales consulting business. That was my first online business ever. And I started it because I had a really good friend named Hunter who was crushing it with a marketing agency. He was probably making like, say crushing it in relative terms, but he was probably making 30 something thousand dollars a month. And okay. definitely above average for yeah, a normal like, person. And that's what I was making ish at the time. I had a, I had a base in commissions that got me there too, but his nice. lifestyle was just so much better than mine. And I thought to myself, and he knows this, and I've said this to him and he, he repeats it. I thought if he can do it, then I, I fucking know I can do it kind of thing, you know? And so I started a sales consulting business. He told me, you know, not to, not to quit my job because I had a pretty sweet job and to make sure I kind of eased my way into it. I didn't take that advice at all. I just quit my job and, and hopped in. And that sales consulting biz probably, you know, first, first few months did like a 10 K a month and met a business partner through that, that ended up becoming a partner for a marketing agency, had a really terrible flawed, you know, messy marketing agency that I exited with the messiest exit you could ever imagine, um, after 14 months. And then all of that gave me enough learning experience to start working with guys on some pretty high level stuff like Joel Kaplan, Caleb Maddox and Iman Gadji, and then spent the latter of the two years with, uh, with Iman doing amazing things. And he gave me some amazing vehicle to, to work with and learn from. And, um, 
that's yeah it's been now we're here last few years now we're here <laughs> awesome i never heard that background story before that's why i wanted to ask you in terms of i had no idea you were in car sales yep and so, um one, one thing i try not to let people know too often that i'm apparently getting into every single time I talk to them <laughs> no that, that's just the, the coolest stuff to talk about because it's relatable for people that's fair that's true and then people are like oh shit paul was in car sales i'm in car sales i know where he's at right now people can look at you as like a, a figure to kind of mold their steps after thank you so I love that. And you know, one of the reasons it was a messy exit is because, you know, the guy who bought it, I'm, I'm sure if he didn't buy it, it would have gone downhill. It might've gone downhill afterward. I never really kept track, but the, you know, I tell people now when they scale, like I am not by any means someone to replicate when it comes to, to trying to get to hundred K per month in six months, because when things go up fast, they go down just as fast. Right. And so, uh, Same for crypto. <laughs> fair, not, <laughs> um, I've been with a couple guys for the last few days and all they keep doing is checking their like Coinbase accounts and everything on this crypto bull run. I haven't done it when I'm with you, but I'd be doing that no? too. I, I have maybe like spent 10 or like invested 10 bucks in crypto. Really? I am not a crypto guy. I know nothing about crypto, bro. Yeah. Luke. So we were talking about Luke Alexander. He told me to get into a few things and I was like, okay, how do I buy him? And he's like, he's naming all these different platforms. I'm like, I've never heard any of that. I've yeah. We, for some of the stuff that I do, we work with a few crypto guys and they'll you know send me stuff on wallet and i had to learn how to like actually use a crypto wallet yeah. i'm so inadverse to crypto bro kind of thing. that's even if you throw like 10 20k bro i i, I get better at it because right now on the bull run i know it's stupid not to to do it because it's hard but at the same time man what is it like 99 percent of people end up losing crypto you know? yes i mean just a little more context too i've been in crypto since 2017 that's okay. how i initially made my good money Okay. In the 2021 run. So well, you I'm, can give me advice. I see the thing is, I don't, I don't know anything about it. And it's a terrible thing to start investing because people are like, you know, talking about it because when people are talking about it, usually that's not the right time to invest in it. Correct. And so I just, my investment style dude is Warren Buffett. I'll be happy in 60 years when I get 8% every single kind of year, you know, the more safe um, side. Yeah. I just, okay. I don't, I don't have any, I feel like the way that we make money as business owners is so risky on its own that the last thing I want to do is kind of gamble a little away with crypto. Granted, I do know on a bull run like there, that there currently is, if you have a little bit of discipline, I know you can't make money, mm -hmm. right? I just, I don't know. I, you, you, we were talking about people in the space and I didn't know half of them. I, I live under a rock, bro. My day, James over there has been sitting with me. All I do all day long, it's one of two things. I'm either writing sales letters or PDFs or docs or something like that, or I'm on client calls. Those are the right. two things I do all day. I don't go on social media. I don't do you know YouTube. I don't, I just, so crypto has never made its way in there. So you don't really consume much content. No, not in. You're just creating the content. I don't create content either. You know, or creating, I'm now I starting say. to do some stuff with podcasts and everything. Yeah. Uh, and I think I'll probably have to consume some content to become better at creating content. I think you have to consume to create, but no, I don't, I, I work with content guys and they know all the content stuff. I know nothing about it. I'm very, very ignorant to the content world. I probably have learned a lot about it that people don't know through osmosis, through working with the guys that I have had mm -hmm. the, the blessings to work with, but by no means am I, am I a content guy. Soon though, soon, soon. You know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I want to touch on a point that you mentioned a few moments ago before yeah. we jumped into crypto and stuff unexpectedly, but you mentioned the point of you already having that mentality of having the seven figure mindset. How would you be able to teach that to somebody? Would you even be able to teach that to a beginner? No, the whole thing, dude, is it's relative. Everything is relative. I was writing something on speed the other day. So example given, if you asked a person making $2,000 a month, if they thought they worked hard and fast, they would say yes, yeah. almost every time. And if you ask the same thing about a 10K per month person, a 100K per month person, a 500, 1 million, whatever per month, everyone always thinks they work fast. But the analogy I like to use is let's pretend you went back to the Model T days, like the first Ford Model T, the top speed was 40 something miles per hour, which is slow. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, that was lightning fast, right? So imagine you popped like a Lambo Urus into that street that the Model T was on, you would have mentally fucked everyone there because what you would have done is shatter what their perception of fast was. And so think about like, every, speed is a relative term. We know that. It's just how fast you're going. But people only measure speed in what they look at as their, like their top, you know, what, what's the top of your speedometer? Mm -hmm. So if you get into a car, if you get into a Bugatti, Bugatti, the speedometer will go to, you know, I don't know what, but much higher speed than if you get into a minivan, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what I would think you would have to do to understand what a seven, eight, nine figure entrepreneur looks like mentally is you just have to kind of have your, 
your perception shattered by seeing it. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people, what they should do instead of starting a business is work with really, really high level people and see it so that their perceptions are shattered and they operate in different ways. You'll get a lot further, a lot faster if you shadow Alex Ramosi through being one of his setters, even though you might not see a lot of Alex Ramosi, they think of it like, let's the say process you're going to see that, but also let's even say it's, let's, let's say Hermosi. you probably have Hermosi and then C-suite and then a layer here and a layer here and a layer here. And you might be down here where you never see Hermosi, but every single one of those layers is just a watered down version of Hermosi. And as you start to scale, you'll get closer and closer. It's almost like a gravitational pull, mm -hmm. right? The closer you get, the more you see the, the you know, and such. And the, and by through osmosis, the different, the, the different you'll, the different, how do I word this? You'll operate differently. Okay. And so, um, long story short, I don't think you can teach people to be, you know, a seven figure entrepreneur or how to work faster or such. I think you have to shatter their perception on showing them what, the, what, what it looks like, which is why, uh, if you ever talk to Ty, Ty Lopez, one of his favorite things to do is study people. So he studies billionaires and presidents and warlords and such. Uh, and I think the reason he does that is because when you study people, you learn how they operated and you learn how you can, you know, what, what a higher level of, of yourself would have to look like kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, even touching on that, when I first went to Miami back in 2021, talk about your perception being shattered. Keep in mind, I'm like a, a pretty like uh, low key town in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. The most crazy thing I would see is like one Ferrari once every three months. I go to Brickell, Miami, and on I every see everything. Yeah, yeah, on every corner, and I see these cool people. I'm meeting, I'm meeting cool entrepreneurs and stuff like that. But when I went back to Jersey, I was like. There's no shot I can stay here for much longer because yeah. my mind was so bent in terms of the possibilities of things. Because guys that were even younger than me were doing better than me. And I was yeah. like, okay, I got to get to the right spot. Money loves community, bro, for sure. What'd you say? Money loves community. Yeah. You know? um, and so and it's actually ironic because I I'd purposely kind of set out to be away from everybody and where my office is is in the middle of nowhere. Like it's in the middle of a cornfield, an hour and a half away from a city that has no entrepreneurs. And so when people see where my office is and come and fly out to me, they're like, why the fuck do you live here, man? And I love it. I love every part of it. But I, I but I'm also, because money loves community, I'm constantly trying to be around other people. And so I'm very deliberate about my, my time with other entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I think, yeah, I think you, it's, you're talking more so about your atmosphere or your environment shattering your perspective. What I mean is, let's say realistically that you are, let's say you're doing 100K a month. If you went and worked with the company that was doing a million a month, you would learn how, what's, how much faster they worked and how, how diligent they were about solving problems in ways that you, would, you were like, I've, you would be exhausted working with them. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. There have only been a handful of companies I've ever worked with. Really one is actually here in Scottsdale where the work that I did it, it actually made me feel like I ran a marathon every single day. You know, like it was exhausting work every single day. And it was the fastest I had ever learned. Um, and that was when I realized what speed actually was kind of thing, speed in the workplace. Everyone thinks they work fast, but then you see what actual fast work. Like it's ignorant to think you work fast because fast is Elon Musk work. Mm -hmm. you know, taking 10 year plans and turning them into essentially like six months and then three months and then a month and such. And so if, you know, if your barometer now becomes like Elon Musk, which is hard to do because no one, you, you, you and I both don't know what he operates like. Yeah. Then it's like, okay, what level of barometer can I feasibly achieve to see what fast looks like? And so I think realistically just trying to work inside of a company with a really high level entrepreneur that you have vis a vision to um, or visibility to, I think that's probably one of the best things you can do when you're starting. 100%. I, I like that analogy you used for the Hormozy, like top of ladder, and then you're kind of being drawn up over yeah. time to see, okay, this is exactly how things are operating at this speed and this sort of systemized uh, fashion exactly and that kind of leads me into one of my talking points and one of my questions what um what was the work environment like and just the overall um, yeah what was the overall work environment like working with iman his team his inner circle how was that was that similar to um, other things you've done in the past or very different no iman iman i've how do i word this iman operates at a higher level than 99% of people will ever even imagine people can operate at. Iman will be a billionaire one day, hands down. He is as close to superhuman as I've ever met. He has a heart of gold. Out of all of your experience so far, what do you think are some key takeaways that you could maybe share light to the audience on that have 
separated you from the pack in terms of your ability to work, your ability to make certain connections, and your ability to just get the job done when it needs to get done and not kind of complain about all these different things going on? I have no idea how to answer that question. No? So key takeaways? Like, what do you mean? Like, Give me one of yours. Um, anybody watching this, Hamza, do the hard work, especially when you don't feel like it. That's oh, like a motto. core value kind of thing. Yeah. Or like, operational value. Yeah. Do you have anything specific or no? Uh, no. I just try not to be a bitch, bro. That's the one thing. Like, I constantly find myself telling people, like, I've, you know, we, you said we've chatted before on a, uh, a call. I, I've coached a lot of people, hundreds, if not thousands of people. And the one thing, it, it makes me come across as a dick, but the one thing I constantly am saying is like, just don't be a bitch. You know, it most, to beat 80% of businesses, all you have to do is work harder, mm -hmm. right? It, 90, it, you've seen it, bro. So many people make so much money and they're stupid. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that like badly. It just, the barrier to make money is not as high as people think it is. It's just putting in a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, going into the 100,000 a month thing, we got to 30K a month, but I spent 10 hours a day just sending out prospecting messages and another four hours a day on sales calls. And that's all I did. Like I was, I spent my life on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and then email. That's all I did. Right. And so I remember when I started coaching people on agency stuff, they were like, Hey, I sent out like 10 messages. And I was like, that's cool for like five minutes. But yeah. like I was sending out probably 500 messages in the morning and like another, however many, like actual, like not email where it's just like blank off, like finding people and doing this, the, the old, you know, the old fashioned way, if you will. Um, I sent out years worth of messages in a month kind of thing. That's how I, how I sped up timeline. And if you do that, then you're going to beat 90, not 90, 80% of people, 70% of people, the rest of them, then you do have to understand how to start to actually have some, some problem solving skills and leadership skills and stuff. But the, the first part is just don't be a bitch. Just do the fucking work. No one, <laughs> I, f I hate talking about stuff this simple because everyone thinks that, um, I don't, I know personally when I first started and I heard just do the work kind of thing, that means nothing, you know, but if you realize that there, every, how do I word this in a way that doesn't sound like every, every single thing that everyone on a podcast says, let's say you, who, your audience, are they newer or are they? A lot of people watching this are just getting started. Okay. So if you're getting, just getting started, you probably have a job, correct? So let's say realistically, this is a common one, but you have either students or people with a full-time job that say that they don't have the time to put in the amount of effort that I did, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's say you have an eight hour job, eight hours per day, right? Or you're a student and you're going to school for eight hours a day. And then you sleep eight hours a day, which almost no one does. Most people sleep less than eight hours. Mo most people don't need eight hours, but let's say you do. That's eight hours left in your day to do whatever you want. Let's also say, I don't think that when you're building a business that you should actually necessarily always be working out. Like everyone says, I think when you, you know, there should always be three priorities in your life. And, you know, one of them, in my opinion, should always try to be God or Christ. One should always be, if you're building a business, the business, and then whatever, you know, if it's working out or if it's whatever else keeps you sane, then mm -hmm. that's the other one. Or if it's your job, it's probably your job, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but let's say you're working out. So let's take another 90 minutes for a workout. So now you're down from eight hours of free time to seven, six and a half hours of free time. Most people just are not deliberate about how they spend that six and a half hours. If you, I forget who talks about this. It's uh, Ryan Serhan said, take your free time and start turning it into minutes. And then t the minutes of the week, the minutes of the, minutes of the month, minutes of the year, and, and really start to count your minutes. And then just be deliberate about making every single minute, like count about sending out prospecting messages. You'll, you'll get so much further, so much faster than thinking you don't have time, mm -hmm. you know, but so much, so many people are just, they're just, I don't know. Don't be a bitch. That would be my one thing. It's not, it sounds bad. I'm sorry. Your but book quote. Yeah. Don't be a bitch. Yeah. I'll get it tattooed. <laughs> now touching more on the, the sales side of things and just, I also heard you mention this as well on a different podcast and I just wanted to ask you again, you have three, like, I think, let me double check exactly what you called it. You said the three superpowers of business. What are they? Getting eyes, turning eyes into money and then an actual business. So you have three people with three responsibilities every business needs to meet. The first is getting eyes. So whether it's, there's two ways to do this in the online world for the most part, it's paid ads or content, right? So paid ads because, and what you tend to see is everyone tends to go to one thing and then the other thing is the better thing to do. So right now, everyone's trying to do content, ourselves included. What that means realistically is that if you want to stand out, you probably got to get good at paid ads right now. Cause when everyone's doing one thing, you probably want to do the other thing. Money does not like the masses. 
And so paid ads, content, whatever is right in the market right now, everyone's doing content. So you probably want to get a bit good, good at paid ads. The reason everyone's doing content is because paid ads got fucked and they were super expensive for a long time, competitive, et cetera. Right. But it's always going to be like a back to back, back and forth. One, 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 one. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's first get eyes. The second thing you have to do is have someone or, you know, covering the responsibility in your business of taking eyes and turning them into sales or clients. Uh, so, uh, sales, you know, a CRO, a COO, a, sometimes that's the CEO, a sales manager, a VP of sales, but someone who, someone or a team of people who take short form content and views and turn them into dollars. Right. And then you have to have someone who actually does the business side on the back end too. So your operations, your legal, your HR, your finance, your, you know, what actually makes the business stick together, that boring stuff that has to be, you know, accounted for. Those are the three powers or, or things that every single business needs to have in order to succeed. You heard it first right there. The only <laughs> things you need nowadays, those three things, three individual, uh, three individual players that are all doing their own thing yeah. in a group when you, effort. When you start, it can be just you. You know, yeah, at, at a higher you, level though, at a higher level, each responsibility needs someone, mm -hmm. someone or multiple people focusing on that one responsibility. hundred yeah. percent. Okay. What most people do is they try to do too much. Yeah. Generally. And I, I want to jump into your sales experience and your sales processes too. Okay. Since you have a really in-depth background in sales, what would you recommend for building a sales or a bulletproof sales process for an online business? It's almost every podcast I go on gets into this stuff, right? But in short, I'm going to zoom out and make it as simple as possible, yeah. but you need to have, it's going to be those three things, but I'm going to tell you how right. they work, right? You either need to run paid ads to get views, or you need to get organic content that can beat other organic content to get views and get eyes. The first thing you need is eyeballs on a business. Eyeballs create awareness. And I'm not even that. Eyeballs give you the ability to create awareness because a lot of people will create eyeballs and not even make people aware of what they're doing, right? The next thing you need to do is get people off of social media. If that's, and I'm going to mostly talk about organic content because that's where a lot of the guys I work with are, but the, you, you want to get people away from social into your internal sales process as much as possible. I haven't talked about this on a podcast yet, but it's just kind of mentally coming to me again. When people are just viewers and they're not leads, then they have to come to you when you have their email, their phone, et cetera, their Instagram handle, you can go to them. And when you get that information, when essentially when it turns in from a, a view to a contact, then you can be much more, I don't want to say aggressive because a lot of people don't look at that word uh, correctly, but you can be a lot more deliberate about making, you know, giving that person more value in return for eventually hopefully getting a sale, right? So the first step is short form content to creating content, contacts. Uh, creating contacts can be free school groups, which is a really common one right now. Uh, again, I like personally doing things that are different. And so example given, I don't have a free school group. I have a dollar per day Slack group, right? Uh, I don't think that if you do the same thing that everyone does, there's anything about you that'll stand out. One of my better, better friends in life has a great quote, which is better is not better. Different is better. And I think it's awesome. And so I, I strive in everything I always try to do in business to be very different than everything that other people are doing. So if people are Matt housing. I know you said you're on school, so I'm sorry. I'm about to launch one right now. Okay. Well, I'm about to try to just persuade you not to, but if everyone's making a school community, then you're just one voice in, in a, a mass amount of, you know, in a mass crowd shouting school, school, school. And I, I love Sam and I love Promosi and I'm not trying to say don't do school. I think it's an awesome platform. I think it's best in class for what it is, but I also know that Sam's going to, if he ever watches this, I, yeah, Sam's going to be pissed at me. Um, I had a good lunch with Sam once and he's a really, really smart guy. So Sam, I love you. But if everyone's doing the same thing, then there's nothing special about you. Right. And so to be better is to be different, meaning create a day Slack group, maybe even do a Facebook group. Maybe your group is now a WhatsApp, whatever it is, long story. If you're going to, if you're doing a group, be different. It could be a you know, Dan Martell has like 10 books that he will recommend people get to get into. You buy a book, you got, he gets, you know, you get a little bit of value. It might even be free. You just pay for, for tax or shipping or whatever it is, but he gets your contact. Right. And so that whole, the whole thing becomes, if you look at drink, you know, Dan Martell, Grant Cardone, uh, Sabri Subri, Tony Robbins, et cetera, it becomes, how do we take a view and turn it into a contact by giving them something for as little barrier to entry as possible. And then through that, uh, selling on the back end, right? And so building out a sales team that ideally has a ton of free value that they can give. They can, you know, for my sales team, we're creating 50, 60 page PDFs. We're creating long video walkthroughs of how to do different things. We're, you know, creating different 
Google Sheet dashboards and, and templates, Monday.com um, templates and stuff like that. So people can just, like, if we see that you're in some kind of industry and we learn a little bit about, about you, we can be like, hey, you know, take this. And that reciprocity bias will do really cool things and strong things. If you ever want to want to become a much more powerful business person, watch, not watch, but listen, um, not listen. Bro, my brain is apparently dying. It's hot in here. Are you not hot in here? Well, I know, the AC just came on. Yeah, cool. I'm hot in here. When we were <laughs> setting up in here, I was like, this place needs to cool off right now. Um, Charlie Munker has his cognitive, cognitive biases at the end of his almanac. And so if you ever want to become really strong in business, read those, read those cognitive biases. One that will make you a lot of money is understanding reciprocity bias, right? And so if someone gives you a gift, you feel really bad if you don't get them a gift in return. So think about Christmas. Someone gives you something, you don't have something in return. You feel like a piece of shit. That goes a long way in business too. If someone gives you a, a book that gives you hundreds if not thousands of dollars of value for seven dollars and then they also give you free stuff free stuff free stuff and then they're like hey i think you should have a call with our team the odds of you getting on that call are way higher than if someone's like hey i saw you watch a youtube video let me see if i can try to sell you something you know which is what most people try to do most people are lazy because to build out all that stuff it takes a lot of, like i said most of my time is just writing sales letters on my computer or talking to clients that's, that's all i do write that stuff out and it's almost like leverage that my sales team now has and most other teams don't. It's almost like my sales team is a, a gun and that's the ammunition that they have to fire. Most people create sales teams, but then don't give it their sales teams anything besides a script. Uh, and I would argue nowadays that the competitive nature of the industry is getting so high that just a, a well-tuned sales team with a script is not going to get the job done like it could before. So you see this, this massive need for reciprocity bias more than you ever have. So that's the kind of start to finish. I 100% agree with that too, because in, like, the overall message of that is have some sort of lead magnet and giving free value. Yeah. That's literally all it is. And for years at this point through high level, I've had my own high level course for affiliate stuff as well. As some of the most successful people that I know have a, uh, a free course where they'll give away everything. Yeah. You know, Sebastian, for example, free course on dropshipping. He has like several affiliate links in that free course though, yep. where he's giving out all this information the, the viewer and the consumer is going to be like, man, he's giving me all this information away. I'm definitely going to try drop shipping right now. Boom, sign up. Yep. So that as well as owning your audience, capturing their email, capturing their phone number. And like you said, turning a viewer into a potential buyer of yours down the road. Yeah. That's why like people complain these days to think about email, like email lists and stuff like that. Um, but they're still so powerful. Yeah. I it's, I am one of those people that I'm like, I never check my email. This, you know, like, why is it affect? But email will make you a lot of money. Yeah. When you start turning people into email contacts, it'll make you a lot of money. The other thing too is, you know, if you look at info products, then the other side of this too is info products. I don't think that the, the practice of charging for information will last much longer. I think the, the pro I think everything has to now change to charging for the application of information. Yeah. So realistically, everyone can go on YouTube and find stuff out, right? And the whole game of a sales process before was essentially saying like, hey dude, you can go on YouTube, but it's gonna take you a lot longer to find the right information, the right people to teach you, et cetera. You can also just come to us, we're proven, that's what, you know. I don't think that works anymore. I think realistically, what you're starting to see, you know, you have Cole Gordon, Hermosi, um, any guy, like, you know, any big guy in the space just putting their course content out for free at this point. And they're just saying, when you are confused by this, which you will be, and you don't know how to apply it, that's what we're here for kind of thing. And so the, the free, the free stuff is, um, pretty indisputable at this point. I think the one thing that most people do wrong with it is they try to be lazy with it. For example, give and take course content with course content does not do well online as content. Like it doesn't, uh, you know, internally. And so you see a lot of guys just creating an hour and a half zoom call for their community and then posting on YouTube. I think that's like the shittiest way to go about this entire process. I think that anything is that's front facing has to be designed to be front facing because the other side of this too is if you put, it's not even that it needs to be valuable. It has to be perceived as valuable, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the things that you see the best content creators in the world do is they might not teach you as much as some of the most niche guys, but you'll watch the entire video. Their watch times are super high and they're, the, the hooks and everything are, are really, really solid. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, example given, if you looked at, um, let's use, uh, I don't want to use Iman, but let's use a, a big content. Give me a content creator. Let's use Sebastian. So, uh, okay. Let's use Seb. And then let's use Cole Gordon. Cole will bore you to death, but you will learn a fuck ton of stuff watching Cole, right? Cole's smart. Seb, 
I've actually never watched Seb, but I'm sure you you'll learn a good amount, like you know, a decent amount. But you won't learn as much as Cole because he's going to optimize for watch time, not for value. And so there's a difference between perceived value, which is you know more Seb, versus value, which is more Cole. And I think perceived value is the right way to do front-facing content for the most part. It's the same reason that when people make books, the books are 200 pages long, not two pages long. Because if you gave someone a two-page book that gave you all the information as a 200-page book, they would be bored. They'd be like, I'm not going to learn anything from this. But if you give them a 200-page book, the perceived value is so high that they're like, oh my God, thank you so much. Yeah. You know, and so they I wouldn't value the like super intricate details that actually move the needle exactly uh, opposed to what you're saying adding more like fat around the the proper things yeah. to do people and stuff. like fat man no yeah. one admits to it everyone's like oh, i don't want to read a book because it's got a fluff blah 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 but there is a reason that you know publishers will not publish 10 page books mm -hmm. it's because people like fat you know i want to go back a little bit regarding we're, we're talking about books right now and it has me thinking mm -hmm. back when you were younger too there was definitely some sort of process of when you were building that internal work um, as you know, not even a young entrepreneur at the time, but a young salesman, were there anything that you were consuming specifically to improve your, your skills or was it strictly as a experience? sales rep? Yes. Yeah. Favorite books as a sales rep would be gap selling by Keenan. You ever read it? No, I have not. Love that book. Uh, my first sales book that I ever liked or, or read like three times was when buyers say no by Tom Hopkins. Uh, that was, I, I think I actually gave that book away recently. Um, but I loved that book and I'll probably buy it again and read it again. Uh, Perfect Pitch was a good one. When I, so my first, going back to the car sale stuff, I, my first commission check ever was like 300 something dollars. And I spent all that check just buying sales books. I just, I went to Barnes and Noble and, and it was probably like eight or something sales books I could buy because Barnes and Noble is so expensive. Um, I love Barnes and Noble. I'm not trying to smack talk them, but anyway, so <laughs> I, I, bought like eight, I bought like eight or nine <laughs> books from Barnes and Noble and I would read them at the dealership when it was dead. I actually left that dealership trying to, I think I would try to go to school or something like that. Came back and the, my sales manager Lamont hired me back. And he said, the reason I'm hiring you back is because you're the only person I've ever seen invest into actually trying to get better at sales and, and learn. Um, and he had been the same way. So I definitely read a lot of books, but the ones that I remember, Gap Selling came after. Gap Selling by Keenan is a great book. But when buyers say no, I read that like three times and that really gave me a good understanding of how to, to loop is what it's called. Um, in modern day sales, it's called looping. Uh, he calls it like the, the objection handling circle or whatever you want to call it. But essentially how to take people from a no to yes after they give you a no. That's a very valuable skill as a sales rep. The rest of it's just reps and experience. Okay. Yeah, because I feel like I, I know for a fact, even from my own experience, you know, I am very quick to hire in terms of offloading calls and stuff like that. Yeah. I personally don't enjoy them. So I know a lot of people watching this right now as well don't like the entire sales process of having to go talk to a prospect or talk to somebody um, and close that. But genuinely, yeah, the, the secrets people look for is in the reps. The problem most people have, dude, is exactly what you said. They want to get out of the process too fast, right? And so I remember when I first started, I wanted, the, I hate prospecting. I told you I sent an obscene amount of messages out. It's not like I like doing that. But the thing is, there's a couple of sides. Number one is you learn and without you being a top tier, there's like five things to this if I can just brush through all the points, yeah, right? This is gonna be very unstructured. But number one is sales reps don't tend to be um, ceiling breakers. Meaning what you have to do is essentially show people that it can be done. And so if you bring in people too early, then there's not a lot of confidence on your on your sales floor that number one, the guy training them and leading them knows what they're doing, but number two, that they can do what you've said they can do and make X amount of money, right? And so before you ever hire sales reps, let's say you realistically, you, you wanna have a rep that can make 10K per month. You need to create a comp plan and then on your own comp plan, get to a point where you're making 15K per month before you should ever even consider hiring a sales rep because they're never gonna close as well as you. They shouldn't, they don't, they're not your, you know, they're not the business owner. They don't understand the, the industry and the problems that you solve as well as you do. So there's gonna be a diminishing return. But that's number one. Number two, when I was prospecting, another good example is I realized that I was getting most of my responses from X demographic. It was real estate, so it was like 35 year old woman in the United States where the people were applying to me mostly. It sounds crazy. So I just, when I ended up delegating it, I told my VA, hey, these are the people replying to me. These are the, everyone else doesn't reply nearly as much. So just hit up 35-ish year old blonde girls in the United States that are in real estate. And it made our outbound, so, that sounds so weird out of context, but it made our outbound so much more effective. 
lower level, you know, VAs or setters and such wouldn't recognize that kind of pattern and it would make the entire process more inefficient. So realistically, the whole thing about you putting your reps in is you learn, but you also see patterns, right? And the whole thing about being a business owner is that you should recognize patterns better than anyone else in your business to an extent. You should have really smart people that recognize patterns in their field. But if you bring on a setter that is, you know, looking to make two, three, four, five thousand dollars a month, they're not going to recognize patterns like that, right? It's a very rare skill. It's actually, you know, part of what's called, if you ever go into Criteria Core and do what's called an aptitude test, a CCAT test, pattern recognition is one of the hardest skills that most people don't have or, or almost uh, born aptitudes that people don't have. And so as a business owner, if you delegate too early, you're not going to know what your common objections are so you can, you know, start to tailor your offer to, to, to conquer that. Or maybe you change your pre-call material to start to conquer that. You're not going to know what people tend to come to the call thinking or feeling. You're not going to know who you tend to close most um, versus not in terms of like their, their personas and such. And because of that, since you delegated so early, you're going to be blind in a way that keeps you from being able to, to really create the systems and processes that get people to, to, you know, to a closing call as close as possible prior to. So what most people, you know, Hermosi, one of his acquisition.com core values, I think is do the boring work. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is because in this space, the boring work is what teaches you everything about your business that you have to do in order to actually give yourself leverage. The other thing too, realistically sales reps are the most expensive people in business to bring on i know that the whole thing is you're only paying them a, a commission or percentage of what you're you know what you're earning but the opportunity cost of sales reps is higher than almost any other uh, you know placement that you can have inside of a company and on top of that when it comes down to it realistically if you could just save 10 percent top line of your company that's 20 percent profit on 50 percent margins that's a f ton more money you know if you're making 50 grand a month you're making ten thousand dollars more a month in, in in profit by not having a closer and so for most people there's not higher leverage things that they can do than sales calls they just get out of it too early because they they don't like it or they think it's beneath them or whatever be it but realistically the the best business owners that you know they're they're always focused on what's the highest leverage thing I can do. What's the thing that's going to make me the most amount of money. And for a long time, probably north of a hundred thousand dollars a month, it's almost always taking sales calls mm. almost always. Uh, and if you don't know how you're going to fill your time that is currently bit on sales calls with something that's going to give your company more, more business and more money, then you should not be getting off sales calls. Right. And so it's just like when you first start, let's say, you, you know, you're sending out the prospecting messages, then you're doing discovery calls. If you're doing prospecting messages, then you're doing closing calls. The first thing is let me get off the prospect prospecting messages after I, I understand the patterns and, and, and how that works. You essentially built out the SOP so that someone can come in and do it straight out. Right now you're doing discovery calls and closing calls. You can take more discovery calls because you're not prospecting. The next thing now is okay. I can take more closing calls because I'm on discovery calls all day. So if I'm not on discovery calls, that allows me to be on more closing calls, which is a more money-making activity. So let me get a setter or a triage or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Right. Now I'm on closing calls all day, going from closing calls all day to what now do I do to make the company more money? You have to really understand how you're going to give the business more leverage before you make that leap. Cause that's a really big leap that most people kind of underestimate. Right. And so if you're going to spend, let's say you're on sales calls eight hours a day and you can say, okay, for the next, how, not for the next, but from here on out, if I'm not on sales calls a day, that means I'm going to be spending four hours a day on sales letters and four hours a day on creating content to get eyes. That's, that's higher leverage stuff. But most people don't do that. They get off sales calls and they're like, Ooh, I'm good, man. I don't have to like, you know, I'm, you know, like they're just chilling at, at the, I remember this, I would be having coffee and a closer is closing a deal. And I'm like, Oh, sweet. And that's like the vision of you made it when you're starting as an entrepreneur. But in reality, I just gave up all my leverage, if you will. So I could be lazy. Yeah. And so what I look back at in hindsight, I'm, I'm not, I know you said that, you know, you did and you don't like it too. It was after I did, I went through the process of six months taking my own calls cool. and then I understood the ins and outs for the most part, as well as I have other partners and people that also are on the team. Yeah. So it's not like I just jumped yeah. in for like one month, but, but, but a you're lot saying of people it's very do it, true. It's a lot very, of people do it way too soon. Yeah. And you talk to, you know, we'll use agency owners, guys doing 20, $30,000 a month. And the first thing you want to do is hire salespeople. And I'm like, bro, like your company, you would have to number one for good, for you to have a good sales rep in the online space, you probably have to pay like eight grand a month, seven grand a month. Right. I know everyone wants, everyone wants to make 10 grand a month. There's a lot of closers that make 10 grand a month in the online space, but that's also the top 2% of, of sales earners in the entire country of mm -hmm. the United States. Right. Let's call it a good sales rep makes 7,000, $8,000 a month at 30 grand a month. You're talking about a third ish of your company in, 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 you know, 
like you're going to destroy your margins. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people just do it too prematurely. And if the, you know, if your audience is newer or just getting started, just know you should be on sales calls for a long, long, long time. Or you get into business with somebody who can do it for you. And then you do other things with the back end. That's what I did. I, when I started my first business, I understood that my first business was not something I was going to do for the rest of my life. So I shared the pain, if you will, with the business partner. I got into sales calls. They did the back end stuff. They did all the stuff I didn't want to do. I did the stuff they didn't want to do. We divided and conquered, uh, learned that we could do this kind of stuff and then started learning the other skill sets and then went on our way. Does that make sense? A hundred percent of those. Yeah. I mean, that's just the best way to do it. You best partnership right there. Yeah. You have your own skills. They have their own skills and you guys come together. You all win. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as we're getting closer here towards the end of this, I know we've been going, you've been spitting some game Thank you, uh, the whole time. I want to ask you a more like fun question. Cool. Um, oh no. <laughs> it's nothing too crazy, but do you have some sort of routine, some sort of biohacking tricks that you do, or are you not believing any of that shit? Bro, is it weird if I go crisscross applesauce? I feel like I've been sitting like <laughs> postured all day long. Ah, oh, that is so much more me. That's so much more comfortable. Um, kind of in a way. So. It depends on time of year, but in my garage, I have a sauna and I have a, the plunge, the cold plunge thing, the, like, the bathtub one. Yeah. And so in the summer, I pretty much wake up and I'll do a plunge for like five minutes because I think it wakes me up better than anything else. And then I, I've done a lot of different biohacking like things, bro, and a lot of different routines. What I do now is, I'll tell you what I did when I started and what I do now because I do think it changes based on where you're at in business. What I do now is I wake up and I got an office that's like 20 something minutes away and I'll drive 20 something minutes. And if I have, you know, I usually have guys that are, you know, I probably have four or five people in my house almost at all times at this point, whether it's people I work with, people that are, you know, colleagues or, or whatever, they're just coming over. And one of the 48 laws of power, Robert Greene says like, a, you know, a king is not a king for very long if he lives in solitude. So I have people constantly coming out. Not because of that, I also just love time with those guys. Mm -hmm. So if they're with me, then they'll come, you know, it's good 20 something minutes of conversation on the way to the office or, or such. If I'm alone, I try my best to fill those 20 minutes with, with prayer and just talking to God for 20 something minutes. Sometimes I don't and I just listen to music or I just, you know, have a quick phone call with whoever I need to. But that 20 something minutes allows me to kind of dial in and get into work mode or at least mellow out, if you will. If I'm, if I'm praying, it kind of stabilizes me and, and puts me on a, on a good foundation. And then I'll get to the office at 8 a.m., 8.30, maybe not if it's late. And I'll work until, I don't know, James, we've been leaving the office at like two in the morning sometimes, you know? So yeah, it's just, my routine is wake up, get in the car, go to the office and, and work until let's call it 11 on average. And then I get scared because my office is 100% haunted. And at a certain point at night, I'm not even kidding. I'm like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. So I'll leave, I'll go home and I sauna for like 45 minutes. I turn the sauna on uh, while I'm on the way home with my phone and I go to bed. That's all I do. When I first started, I was trying, I definitely tried to buy a hack more. Right. And so I would do you know, different, different workout things throughout the day to make sure I was moving my body, giving my brain rest. Uh, I love the plunge and I would, you know, I, I probably will do it when summer comes back around, but I would plunge because bro, getting in cold water when it's like 30, 20 degrees. It's a shock. Oh my, no, the shock is fine, but getting in cold water when it's 20 degrees outside already just sucks ass. I don't mind doing it when it's like 70 degrees outside. It's very easy, but when it's cold out, I don't know how people do it on Instagram. Anyway, look, when I, you know, first started, I tried going through different processes where I put my phone away and I did the deep work block in the morning and I, I meditated and I journaled and I stretched. And, um, for me, realistically, it's just wake up, probably check my phone, see what I missed, get in the car, try to pray, get to work and just work for as long as I can, uh, at, at work, I'll probably work for like two or three hours on deep stuff. And then I'll have a little break at like 12 o'clock, one o'clock or something like that for half an hour. Uh, same thing I get in mid work, et cetera. It's really boring, dude. I know it sounds crazy. My routine is that I work, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing I, I wanted you to say that because all these <laughs> kids are like, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? I got to do all these different things. Go to the sauna three times, back and forth, back and forth. No. Like, yeah. bro, the, the stuff that's going to move the needle the most is doing the actual work. Not yeah. any of these little methods and stuff that all these guys are talking about online. Like, of course they might have slight little improvements at a certain level, yeah. the, but the one thing, if I could give one biohacking actually, as I ahead. think about it, that does pay dividend for me is I, I am a huge advocate for mental clarity on intermittent fasting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
I will. I, I won't eat until like 6 p.m. Uh, if I'm really in grind, I won't eat until 10 p.m. And we'll go. The joke lately, we have actually a group chat with all the guys that have been at my my house lately. Uh, our choice of restaurant has been Applebee's because by the time we're done working, everything is closed beside Applebee's. I know, I know bro. That's trust wild. me. I've got like, I eat out proper all the time, way more than I should, but. If I'm, if I'm really actually working, I don't want to leave the office until 10, 11, 12, right? And, you know, Applebee's is the only thing in my area. I, in my area, you can't even DoorDash McDonald's at 11 o'clock. It's chill. Yeah, there's nothing open. Wow. And so we'll go until, until essentially Applebee's is about to close and we'll be like, okay, now we're going to eat kind of thing. And then we'll have a steak and then, and then that's day. But I think that if you are eating throughout the day, you're going to make yourself so much cloudier and more mentally foggy than if you, if you intermittent fast, I don't care about it from a weight perspective. I think you probably can lose weight more easily if you're doing IF, but that's the one thing that, and then sauna at night, dude, sauna, the sauna has definitely helped me like those two things in the biohacking world are probably the two things I attribute most of my, most of my marginal gain of, of focus from the cold plunge is cool, but I don't think that does anything really long-term beside discipline. Yeah, they're the ones that I also am on the same page with, but the people that are doing like maybe the, the red light therapy, I've tried that. Have you done that before? I haven't done it yet, no. I haven't but really I've been, noticed anything. Yeah. No. See, I, I, bro, you can get into like, everyone's focused right now on aura ring sleep scores and, and I, I'm sure there is marginal gain, 100%. But I think at the the marginal gain that goes into it to give you like another half hour focused work, I feel like people put three hours of of labor into getting that extra half hour rather than just getting three hours of inefficient work at 50% to get an hour and a half of productive work. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're at a net loss, essentially. The biohacking, people forget, because the biohacking world's pretty much tied to the entrepreneurial world. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, then you probably need to be a biohacker because you're not an effective entrepreneur if you're not a biohacker. And so people forget that the biohacking world is as much of an MLM of like, buy this, buy this, buy this, as the entrepreneurial world is kind of thing. And so just when you realize that, you know, Hermosi really did, the more I even, I talk about it on this conversation, the do the boring work core value is very, it's something that almost anyone in the entrepreneurial space, in our online space should have as a core value because I heard it, but do the boring work is, you know, everyone wants to find the fancy way to succeed, but yeah, do the boring work. The boring work is where all the sauce is at, is where all the high leverage is going to be in terms of you moving forward because everyone likes to avoid the boring work. Exactly. But Paul, I appreciate you coming on. Very good conversation. And hopefully you guys learned something new from this. I'd be shocked if you didn't learn a new side of Paul Daly here that you probably didn't know before. Dude's a killer. So I appreciate you coming on. And I'm yeah. glad you're out here in Scottsdale. I know you're leaving tomorrow, but we had a nice <laughs> conversation today. Appreciate it, bro. Thank you, G. Catch y'all later.